Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Dmitry Harrison from the University of South Florida, who will speak uh, the subject, the title of his talk is Harold Seymour Shapiro, A Life in Mathematics. Please. Thank you very much. And thank you, Javad, for asking me to do this because uh, I think Harold deserves it. Uh, and I'm still enraged that notices of the AMS uh, didn't give us permission to publish a tribute to Harold for whatever reason. So, uh, and I think uh, he certainly deserves it. So let me, uh, I'll try to make this talk not dry, just listing some theorems. It's very difficult to list all Harold's theorems. So I'll just uh, try to kind of, for people who didn't maybe know Harold to present him as a person besides his uh, mathematics. So uh, now, and how do I, okay. So a few uh, pieces of biographical data. This is Harold, this is uh, a beautiful walk we used to do in the um, suburb of Stockholm where he lived. This bridge leads to Akishov Castle, which is in Broma in the suburb. And that's, uh, that's Harold Shapira, five, six years ago. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he was born in 20, 1928 in Brooklyn. And uh, he went as an undergraduate to City College because it was free for New Yorkers, where he was part of mathematical table, uh, which include, included, uh, just to name the few, DJ Newman, Marty Davis, Jack Schwartz, Leo Flatter, Lee Rubel, and there were several others. And uh, Harold uh, didn't know when he entered college that you can major in mathematics, actually. Uh, the story he told me at some point, uh, DJ Newman told him that in his very straightforward way uh, that we heard you're good. Why don't you major in mathematics like us? Harold was majoring in chemical engineering. And there is a reason for that because his father who was a dentist in real life, but his, his father's dream was to be an engineer. And he actually, all his free time, he dedicated to some inventions. And in particular, he had a patent on one of the first uh, ideas that the cars should warn the cars following them that they're turning. So it was a patent for turning signal. It wasn't very effective turning signal, but it was one of the first. It was actually mechanical arm coming out of the driver's window and uh, showing the turn. So he ma ma uh, initially was majoring in chemical engineering and then he switched the major to mathematics. Uh, and uh, he got his PhD in 1952 at MIT under uh, the direction of Norman Levinson, worked for a, few year, for a couple of years at Bell Labs, and then at NYU at Courant, what is now known as Courant Institute. Courant was, Courant was alive at that time, so it wasn't called Courant Institute. Uh, then at the University of Michigan, for 10 years and then ended up in Sweden uh, as a professor eventually at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. And uh, he, his wife, uh, I didn't put it on the slide, but his wife, Karen Tamark, uh, was from Sweden. Uh, she is a retired clinical psychologist and they had two sons, uh, Max Tamark, who is a uh, quite famous uh, nowadays professor of cosmology at MIT, and uh, Ter Shapira, uh, who is a uh, well-known in Sweden 
Uh, so Max to, uh, eventually took his mother's name. There is a story to that. I just don't have time to go into it. Uh, per Shapira is a radio uh, journalist in Stockholm. And uh, <coughs> so let me turn the page and uh, give a little overlook of Harold's mathematical life. Uh, his main area of interest uh, was analysis, uh, and in particular, it's interplay with functional analysis. Although, when I'll say a few words about it a little bit later, when Harold uh, started in classical analysis, he didn't know any functional analysis, which is a funny story, which will appear later on. Uh, he published research articles and four books. Uh, his most significant imprints, if one can say so, are in approximation theory. He has a textbook, uh, uh, graduate text on approximation theory, complex, harmonic complex and harmonic analysis, potential theory, and the theory of functions of complex variable, I would add. Uh, his already his uh, 1951 master's thesis uh, he discovered special trigonometric polynomials, and I'll say more uh, a little bit later about those polynomials. They, they bear, bear his name nowadays uh, with coefficients plus and minus one, and they appeared as a solutions of an extremal problem. Uh, and uh, the main feature of these polynomials, why the now quite important, you can Google Shapiro polynomials and you will see uh, the output, uh, that there are such polynomials whose supremum norms on the unit circle controlled by the L2 norms, which is certainly a rare case. They nowadays uh, go under the name of Galay, Rudin, Shapiro polynomials, so I'll tell you why on the next slide. And they are super important, I mean, well, not maybe super, but they're really important in applications and communication theory, like antennas design, data compression, and so on. Exactly because of that property that L2 norm is, uh, is uh, basically ruling over the L infinity norm, which is very uh, rare. So that was his master's thesis. Never published, but you can find it easily online. I have a copy if somebody cannot find it, just write to me and uh, I'll uh, be happy to email it to you. Uh, it's actually a masterpiece of mathematical writing, which I will perfect, perfect it through his life. Uh, but um, it just, you, you can't imagine that this is a master master thesis of somebody so young. Uh, <clears throat> uh, his PhD thesis uh, introduced a very novel at the time approach to a wide class of linear extremal problems uh, uh, based on hahn banner duality, linear extremal problems for analytic functions. And uh, it happened that uh, independently my dad in Soviet Union uh, and there were at that time it was during the Cold War there was no communication in uh, between Soviet Union and scientific communications. Uh, he uh, got the same idea independently. Uh, uh, this results appear in a celebrated joint paper in ACTA in 1953 uh, in uh, uh, joint paper was, Werner Rogozinski. Uh, well, uh, at this point, I'll just tell you a curi uh, one curiosity that uh, Rogozinski and Harold never met in, in life. And uh, because when, uh, by the time Harold uh, got to travel to Europe, Rogozinski was dead. And there is more to it. And I'll tell you uh, maybe uh, a little bit later on. Uh, <clears throat> Now, uh, then uh, again, I, you know, 150 articles, I can't in 50 minutes describe them all. So I'm just 
taking few uh, pieces out of his uh, mathematical heritage. And I also try to take pieces uh, which uh, do not concern our joint work. So it doesn't look like self advertising. So it's about Harold. And um, because we've collaborated over very closely over basically four decades. Uh, now, there is a groundbreaking paper with Aharonov in 1976, where the subject of quadrature domains uh, in the complex plane was born. Uh, and uh, I'll tell later what they are, but it's uh, also turned out to connect to, connect to myriads of very important uh, mass physics problems, in particular di dynamics of oil spills, dynamics of gr growth of uh, cancer tumors, uh, governed under uh, sort of the name of Heli Show flaws. Heli Show, by the way, it's one person. There are, it's not two persons, it's just one last name, Heli Show. Uh, it's still a very active field under the umbrella of dynamics of moving boundaries. Uh, a few words about Harold's pedagogical uh, sort of career. After his arrival, uh, let me see, I, I wrote notes because not everything you can put on the slides. Uh, and um, let's see if I uh, <clears throat> miss something. Uh, when he arrived in Stockholm, professors were few and uh, the idea of communications between graduate students and professors were uh, slightly different than uh, they are now. And Harold uh, launched a novelty um, there, the problem solving seminar, which attracted uh, many students and many of the uh, first Harold's uh, students graduated with a PhD under Harold's supervision, uh, came out of this seminar. And some of them were engineering majors at the time. And then they switched to mathematics. And I'll just name uh, Mikhail Benedix. Uh, all of them are professors or retired professors now. Uh, uh, Bjorn Gustafsson, Gunnar Jonsson, Lasse Svensson. Uh, this is a misprint, uh, Karina Ulimar, uh, it's C, it shouldn't be K, uh, Johan Anjansson, and uh, <clears throat> a little bit later, Peter Ebenfeld, uh, Henrik Chagallan, and uh, Andrzej Shulkin, and I may have missed some. Uh, he was, he was a supremely good advisor, as all of his students, former students attest. He was also exemplary speaker and an outstanding expositor. And uh, he has given hundred, over 170 plenary talks, always following the principle, less is more. And I can tell you <laughs> one story. Uh, once uh, in the very beginning of uh, my giving talks, I decided to revolutionize the idea of giving talks on slides and put everything I had to say in 20 minutes on one page. So uh, <laughs> when I asked Harold, how was it? He gently said that uh, maybe next time you could put a little bit less on that page, uh, which I remembered for the rest of my uh, life. Uh, <clears throat> He was extremely generous with his time for students, collaborators, colleagues, uh, like people from other departments in Techniska, and I was a witness to that many times, just felt absolutely free to knock on his door. Uh, and uh, in, uh, at that time, his office was in the terribly designed building, which was colloquially known as Sing Sing, because the design was exactly uh, uh, the same as the famous New York prison, Sing Sing. 
and uh, they would knock on his door and he was there usually with a cup of tea. Uh, he had an electric stove in his office because he liked his tea hot and uh, uh, you know, no, none of his dripping uh, machines could satisfy. He, he, after his stay in Russia for two uh, years, he wanted uh, tea as Russians uh, drink it hot and strong. Uh, and uh, all of his students consider him a fantastic advisor. He always encouraged students, colleagues, uh, people who came with questions. Uh, usually he encouraged his uh, very famous, he quoted from Inferna, uh, students uh, who were worried that what they're doing interests nobody, follow your path and let people talk. And that was a guiding light for many of us, certainly worked for me. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, a little, a few words about Harold as a intellectual, not only a mathematician, but in general intellectual. He actually, mathematics was a part of many intellectual endeavors and his curiosity that he pursued over his life. He, uh, he was kind of a unique in his ability to create an, intellectual atmosphere around him. Uh, his love for mathematics in particular. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, any intellectual pursuit in general, his uh, incredible erudition was remarkable. He spoke fluently four languages. Uh, Russian was one of them, which is not that easy. Uh, his Swedish uh, was uh, very good, and uh, he took it as a pride when people detected a slight accent in his Swedish and asked him, you must be from Gotland. It's an island off coast of Sweden. Uh, and uh, he had this very special Eastern European Brooklynish sense of humor, and it will be uh, uh, missed. Uh, Greatly, I think. Uh, and uh, well, as example of his sense of humor, I can tell you one story before we get to mathematics. We were there was a conference, uh, uh, AMS Winter meeting, in 1992 in uh, Baltimore, uh, and there was a couple of special sessions on Bergman spaces at the time, maybe 1993. And uh, several of us were sitting at dinner in a Greek restaurant, and we tried to order an extra bottle of wine, and they came back and said that uh, they don't have any more red wine. Then we asked for more bread, and they came back and said that uh, they, don't, they don't have any bread either. So Harold immediately quipped that, well, when they come with the bill, we'll tell them that we run out of money. Uh, okay, so let's let me talk a little bit about uh, mathematics. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Harold was extremely proud of his master's thesis, as he said to me, and I'm sure to other people on many occasions that uh, everything is certainly good, but when one discovers some, something about polynomials, that will stick and that will stay. And these polynomials, uh, in fact, uh, he discovered them absolutely independently. Uh, it, they were discovered by uh, a Swiss engineer working for Bell Labs, Golay. And then uh, Walter Rudin, who was at the time of Harold being a graduate student, Walter, Walter Rudin was a um, more instructor at MIT. Uh, he had a slightly different approach and published it uh, in 1959. And that's what kind of uh, made the reference to Harold's master thesis known. Uh, so 
In short, what are those polynomials? Uh, those are examples uh, of uh, just few of them uh, of degree zero, it's just one of degree one, it's uh, <clears throat> and plus, uh, one plus Z. In, in general, the degrees are powers of two minus one of these polynomials. Now, not all, uh, they, you cannot get them for all degrees, just for uh, kind of series of gap degrees. Mm -hmm. And those coefficients uh, of these polynomials, which are all ones or minus ones, as you can see, they sometimes, if you Google, uh, they're called uh, Goulet Shapira uh, sequences. Uh, and uh, the inductive definition of the polynomial, the next one comes from the first one. If you substitute z squared for z and then add uh, multiple of that times z. And the, all the coefficients are plus or minus uh, uh, negative, uh, positive or negative ones. And here's the fundamental property, which I sort of briefly mentioned. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, that uh, if you calculate, which is certainly not a trivial calculation, never a trivial calculation to calculate L infinity norm of anything, uh, uh, if you calculate the L infinity norm on the unit circle of these polynomials, uh, it's bounded by uh, two times uh, uh, two to the power n plus one, which is you can write as two times degree plus one. But of course, since they have coefficients plus and minus one, uh, the L2 norm is easily computed and it's just degree plus one. It's just sum of the squares of uh, ones, uh, as many of them as the degree. And um, so from that, you derive that the L infinity norm is bounded by uh, universal constant, whatever it is, times the L2 norm. And as I said, that's fundamental for applications in electrical engineering for signals, uh, signal processing and such, because uh, this almost never happens. And in mathematics, I may be wrong, but I think Harold mentioned that uh, it was initially a question of Erdős, uh, whether you can find trigonometric polynomials with uh, coefficients plus and minus one, uh, whose uh, L infinity norm is comparable always with uh, L2 norm. Uh, well, it's not trivial construction in his thesis, although it's uh, <clears throat> extremely clearly and well written. So I just say that uh, it the basic idea is to study in depth the extremal uh, problem. Uh, which is written here, maximize the L1 norm, I, I'm sorry, there is an absolute value sign missing here, of polynomials uh, of degree N, whose um, coefficients are bounded by one. It's uh, certainly uh, not a trivial, not a standard extremal problem, but uh, studying this extremal problem uh, that Harold discovered uh, those polynomial, the solutions of these extremal problems, uh, they have this incredible property of bounded uh, L infinity norm. So, uh, unless there are some questions, I'll go to the next slide, which is uh, about his PhD thesis. The PhD thesis <clears throat> uh, he defended in 1952, uh, and I'll tell you the story uh, uh, behind uh, it. it. It's published as a joint paper with Werner Rogozinski in ACTA in 1953. Uh, the story is, um, uh, let me look at my notes so I get it exactly right. Uh, uh, 
the story is this. Uh, so Harold wrote this thesis uh, where he developed uh, an approach to the whole class of linear extremal problems, uh, I'll specify a little bit later, uh, for analytic functions in the framework of Hardy spaces. Uh, uh, Rudin traveled to Europe that summer and he met with Rogozinski because he knew Rogozinski because Rudin, ran, if you read uh, Walter Rudin's autobiography, he ran from Nazis from Vienna and spent some time in England before coming to the US. Uh, and he met with Rogozinski. Rogozinski had already a paper, sort of continuation of his previous paper in ACT on extremal problem with Massentire, uh, accepted to ACT mathematics. But Rogozinski's uh, paper could, uh, and his methods could handle all HP except H infinity because he missed somehow F and M Ries theorem. Again, I'll get to nitty gritty on the next slide. And uh, so Harold has had everything Rogozinski had plus H infinity. And here's the situation. Uh, Rogozinski puts a name of a person that nobody knows, a graduate student, on his, his paper already accepted into Acta Mathematica. Uh, just think about it for a second, and hopefully there are still people who would do it nowadays. Uh, it's quite an amazing story because I didn't know it until Harold told me the story, and they never met because uh, uh, they had very brief correspondence uh, when Rogozinski asked Harold's permission to put his name on the paper. But uh, that's quite an instructive, I think, story because when Harold got to Europe, Rogozinski was already dead, sadly. Uh, and at the time, Rogozinski was very well known uh, classical analyst. So what's, uh, what's the shtick here? And after I describe you what it is, I'll tell you something else, which is very funny. So there is a Han Banner distance formula, which governs uh, the whole approach. And here's the uh, clean cut situation. You have a Banach space and you have a subspace E. And I try to sort of uh, show it on, on the picture. Uh, X star is a, as usual is a dual space, space of continuous linear functionals. And uh, E perp is a, mm, it's a subspace of the dual space, which annihilates e, all functionals that uh, vanish on the subspace. And there are two uh, sides of this Han Banner distance formula. If you fix a functional phi star and you want to solve this extremal problem, maximize the value of the functional on the unit sphere of E, that supremum is the distance from the functional to all the functionals that annihilate distance in the usual norm of the dual space. That's uh, one side of this. The other side is the uh, sort of the, the problem which is dealt, the whole approximation theory is in that uh, problem too. You take an element uh, in the Banach space X, element omega, and you try to approximate it in the norm of X uh, by elements from the subspace. And that distance uh, <clears throat> uh, sometimes it's realized, sometimes it's not, that depends. But the distance is always uh, equal to the supremum uh, of values of all linear functionals uh, with, in an aggregate of V with norm less than one, uh, evaluated at one. And uh, so it's applied in the context of spaces of analytic functions and subspace, it's very important because 
if you try to do it with other spaces, you have problems. But hard spaces, which are subspaces of Lebesgue spaces on the unit circle. Uh, so E usually is a hard space with uh, index P, P between one and infinity. Uh, omega uh, of is the uh, linear functional and it's a function in LQ. And uh, the action is just the integral. So uh, if I may go to the next slide. Uh, and the question is, why is it so efficient? Because uh, as you can see, the crucial point here is to know annihilator, to know something about annihilator of the subspace. And in case of uh, hard spaces, the annihilator is given by F and M Ries theorem. It's uh, which was proved in uh, by Trigish uh, uh, and Marcel Ries uh, in 1919, I believe, their paper. Uh, and it's just hard space more or less itself, except uh, reduced to function, except the constants, uh, all functions in the hard space with conjugate uh, index uh, vanishing at the origin. Then uh, when you do the routine proof of existence equality uh, and uh, uh, go through equality in Helder's inequality, that leads, that's the key of the solution of all this extreme problem, the equality of differentials, so to speak. So the extremal in the soup problem times the uh, difference between the functional and the best approximation from the annihilator is, and that differential times the zeta on the boundary is positive. And from that, using reflection, using uh, just canonical function theory, you, one gets tremendous mileage. So uh, certainly uh, <laughs> I can't uh, uh, say much more, but uh, like the problem usually when you have omega to be a rational function with some poles in the disk. So the problem you're considering, let's say supremum problem, is to maximize the absolute value of these finite linear combinations of functions in the unit ball of HP, evaluate a linear combination of the values at derivatives at fixed points. And uh, that duality, that equality of differentials basically allows you to say everything qualitatively about the solution. I mean, qualitatively is not quantitatively, and certainly as my father used to say that I, I, I consider to be an expert on extreme problems, but I never solved one of them. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, you get the structural formula, which is very important. And that uh, approach generalized many ad hoc previous solutions for specific problems going back to Thayer, Sass, uh, Frigish Ries, and so on and so on and so on. Well, uh, here's the funny point. Neither Harold at the moment of the writing of this, nor my father, surprisingly, knew Han Banach theory. Their proofs both were absolutely classical analysis to de force mathematics. Uh, in Harold's case, it was Alan Shields who pointed out to him several years after Harold got his PhD that uh, the key is Han Banach theorem. In my father's case, it was his advisor, Markushevich, who pointed out to him uh, the article of Lusternik in Uspehi uh, was the basics of functional analysis. But it's sort of funny because they discovered the major functional analytic approach to the wide class of problems without knowing any uh, functional analysis. All right, so uh, the other topic, unless there are some questions I wanted to touch, uh, was uh, quadrature domains. And uh, Dova Haronov and Harold, uh, Harold's work uh, on the, launching the subject, basically, in some sense. 
So what happened um, in the early 1970s, uh, Dov, Akharonov, and Harold uh, tried to study the minimal area problem in this, well, it's, it's a subclass, it's kind of a misstatement here a little bit, sorry about that, uh, of the famous class S of univalent functions starting with Z and blah, 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 blah. And uh, you are given uh, first two terms. So one is Z and basically everything depends on the second coefficient at this uh, Z squared of a univalent function. And uh, you want to find the minimal area. In other words, the minimal, uh, minimum for Dirichlet integral in this class when you're given the second coefficient. And uh, there are some cases when it's trivial, when it just, you don't have to do anything. It's just that quadratic. Uh, that's uh, not very interesting. And uh, uh, what just happened? Oh, sorry. Uh, and uh, well, it's not going to get anyone any riches. Uh, that problem is very difficult. Uh, they couldn't solve it. In the 70s, the solution was obtained 20, the solution of that problem was obtained 25 years later uh, with a major contribution from Alex Salinian. There is a, a there, there is a set of two papers, uh, joint uh, Dov, uh, uh, Harold, and Alex uh, in journal the analyst was solved this problem completely. Uh, however, the, the, the reason why they couldn't solve it without Alex Linen is uh, because in this problem, nonlinear problems, uh, the problem of regularity, uh, Nonlinear problem, and when you look for area, you're talking about Bergman norms, so to speak, for derivative of the function. And in those problems, the question of regularity is way, way more difficult than in uh, linear problems or in uh, hard space context. And actually, sometimes it depends on the problem. It's it's really technically non-trivial. You know, like some years ago with Dov and Harold and Catherine, uh, we discovered uh, certain very simple extremal problems, uh, nonlinear problems where solutions uh, were not even continuous in the closed disk, which was an absolute shock. And then uh, later on, they were investigated uh, very thoroughly by Terry Shield Small. So it's that's the difficulty. That's why they couldn't do it, and they needed a technique of symmetrization from uh, Salvini. Uh, however, as a byproduct, uh, surprisingly, came the notion of a quadrature domain because it turns out turned out that uh, if you forget the problem of regularity of extremal functions, the extremal function if it happens to map the disk on Jordan domain, that domain is going to be uh, a cardioid, which is a quadrature domain of order two. And so uh, Harold and Dov wrote this paper. <laughs> they forgot the problem that started all this. And they wrote this seminal paper uh, published in Journal of the Analysis in 76 uh, called Domains Admitting Quadrature Identities for analytic functions. Uh, and uh, well, <clears throat> so they uh, coined the notion of a quadrature domain uh, and uh, they sort of rediscovered the Schwartz function and I'll uh, tell you what it is in a second, uh, which was already, uh, there was a book by Phil Davis uh, written uh, not because of it's any connection uh, to the initial extremal problem, but uh, it's called the Schwartz function and its applications. So uh, the quadrature domain is the domain, bounded domain, let's say, it doesn't have to be bounded, uh, in the complex plane, such that when you integrate every analytic function with respect to area, the integral can be replaced by uh, just evaluation, point evaluation at finitely many 
points, which is like applied mathematicians dream or uh, calculus to student dream. You don't have to do the integral, you just evaluate. Uh, and uh, those are quadrature domains for obvious reason, the name, uh, because uh, you know the area integral is a point evaluation. Now, uh, the Schwartz function, when the boundary of the domain is real analytics, so you can write its equation in terms of uh, a Z conjugate equals to some function analytic near the curve. And the terminology uh, is very natural. It uh, goes back to Phil Davis. It's because if you take conjugate of this function S, uh, so it's conjugate analytic function, so on the curve, it's going to be just identity Z. Uh, it turns out to be Schwartz reflection uh, map near the curve. So uh, observation of Aharonov and Shapiro was that quadrature domains are precisely those where that Schwartz function extends metamorphically into the inside the domain. And that was fundamental. And that subject uh, is um, very, active up to today because then it turned out to be connected to uh, to moving boundary problems and uh, various applications well as it often maybe always happens in mathematics it's not that <laughs> those concepts were not known before they were not named but they were known it turns out later on when uh, uh, the subject Evolved, it turned out that already Herblots in 1914, Wavre in 1913, Erhard Schmidt around 1912, even goes going back to uh, not very well known mathematician now, uh, Bruns in 1871 in his PhD thesis. Uh, he should be better known because he was a very good mathematician, a student of Weierstrass, and actually in lesser degree of Kummer. Uh, because uh, among other things, he was advisor of Hausdorff and Koenig and also 25 other students. So he was quite influential at the time. Uh, and uh, the problem they all addressed in various contexts was if you have a domain and you look at the logarithmic potential or gravitational potential, so to speak, in the plane of that domain, uh, which is a harmonic function outside the domain. So uh, how far it can be extended inside? And that was a question which Herlotz solved more or less completely uh, in his memoir. Uh, the answer is in two dimensions. In uh, It's still developing subject in other dimensions. Uh, that it you can continue it every way except singularities of Schwartz function of the boundary. Uh, and uh, as I said, this set of concepts and results turned out to be connected to fundamental pro processes studied by physicists and applied mathematicians, Haley Shaw, uh, growth of oil spills, cancer tumors, and what diffusion limited aggregation growth and, and so on. DLA. Uh, I uh, also want to say uh, that um, the reason why, sorry, I hope you can hear me, it's uh, the lawnmower going on near my window, I hope it's okay, uh, but uh, the reason Herbert's memoir was almost forgotten for seven decades, although he got a prize because he answered the question, uh, is because of the date of its publication. It was published in July of 1914. And if you know a little bit of history, you know what happened. Uh, and that concept actually moved Harold's interest to studying in general, global behavior of solutions of linear PDE, which stayed with him until basically the end of his life. And uh, <clears throat> uh, because Herlot's question, 
how far inside uh, the main, the Newtonian potential extends, Newtonian logarithmic potential with a, uh, the main with an algebraic boundary. Uh, the answer is, as far as a uh, solution of this initial value problem, Laplacian is one and the function together with its gradient uh, vanishes on, 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 on the boundary. And that le leads immediately to myriads of questions. Some of them are solved, some of them are partially solved and it's just mathematics doesn't stop as we know, thank God. Uh, for instance, what if we replace uniform density with another say potential density. Uh, is it the singularity set the same? And answer is in general, very general unknown. And yes, for many cases, for instance, for ellipsoids, for cylinders and so on. Uh, the question is, uh, which is the whole program. And uh, I don't have time to talk about it, but it's actually the program which Harold tried to make known in his latest talks in, in his late life, uh, why singularities differ in nature. Some of them from the shape that singularities will be always algebraic or sometimes transcendental. For instance, uh, the shocking example, it's two type of symmetric ellipsoids, a blade spheroid, were two larger in three dimensions, two larger semi semi axis uh, coincide and prolate spheroid when two smaller semi axis coincide. And in first case, all singularities are going to be algebraic. In the second case, they're all going to be transcendental. Uh, then uh, sort of another problem, if you're solving Dirichlet problem in the domain with algebraic bound with a polynomial data, so solution is great inside, but what happens outside? Uh, where are the singularities? Are there singularities? Uh, also the Schwartz reflection principle, we know so well in two dimensions, what happens in higher dimensions? Uh, and there are many other questions I just, which some of them are partially answered, as I said, and some of them are not answered, but I'm running almost out of time. So uh, let me um, just, and this is just a very little slice of what uh, Harold mathematics was, it just several big topics that he dedicated a lot of many years and a lot of time to and lots of papers, but. As I said, he had several seminal results in function in classical functions. So uh, to summarize, uh, I mean, to me, Harold has always served as an example that I wanted to be. He was a stoic, he, uh, because he has this debilitating disease, which prevented him at the end of his life to write or type. And at the same time, he never stopped being a mathematician, for instance. The last time I saw him, I was in his house when I was in Stockholm. Uh, I was planning to go last summer, but we all know what happened last summer. Uh, two years ago, uh, he showed me his proof because he couldn't write. So whatever mathematics he did, didn't. it had to be conceptual. It couldn't require intricate calculations. He showed me his proof of prime factorization of natural numbers without using Euclidean algorithm. Well, if you think that may be trivial, just try it. Uh, he knew his powers very well. And at the same time, he was never arrogant. I would say rather humble when uh, I was um, 
preparing a talk at his retirement. There was a little conference in Stockholm at his retirement at the age of 67, which was the retirement age in Sweden then. Uh, and I noticed that uh, in some papers, some authors should remain nameless, do not give him credit for what definitely were his discovery. And uh, I remember talking to him and he said, as he usually did by a quote from Shakespeare, what's in the name? Well, if you remember, that's what Juliet said about Roma. Uh, he was always in extremely supportive and encouraging for all kinds of visitors uh, to feel free to come in and to ask any questions. Sometimes, uh, <laughs> especially in my early years, in my early visits to Techniska, I was a little bit worried uh, about some of these visitors because uh, they don't look like authentic scientists. Uh, for instance, if somebody comes to your office in March, in March in Stockholm, which is not a very uh, nice weather with, with uh, a big guy with uh, holes in his jeans and bare foot because he wants to talk about mathematics. And then uh, I was leaving Techniska, I was the only uh, that Sing Sing building, I was the last one. And I remember calling, calling Harold just to make sure he's all right. He was all right. It was actually a mathematician who came in. Uh, his sense of humor, as I said, was uh, incredible. I do miss it. Uh, he, he, it was sort of uh, stemming from uh, having grown up under the influence of Groucho Marx. Uh, he was certainly a man of the world. He, uh, as I said, he spoke uh, several languages. Uh, he played guitar. I don't know how many people know that. He, he uh, sang, he, has, he had a lovely voice, in fact, and uh, a really good ear. Uh, loved poetry, loved literature, uh, was uh, about here, I mean, when unfortunately was nothing could be done and his last, uh, days or hours. Uh, fortunately, his uh, pair, his younger son, was with him uh, constantly. And Harold, I know uh, that Harold was listening to his uh, one of his favorite Russian bard, Okujawa, uh, which pair uh, put for him. Uh, he was uh, very active in human rights movement when he moved to Stockholm, uh, and it was. Uh, in the 70s, and uh, that was a Soviet crackdown on dissidents, in, among other things. And he and his students uh, were often seen demonstrating uh, across the street from Soviet embassy in Stockholm. Uh, my father, who met Harold uh, in the 60s, at some when Harold spent uh, two years uh, in Moscow, he always, uh, which uh, my father was not very generous with compliments. Uh, before even me meeting Harold, he said to me that Harold Shapiro is like uh, Victor Harden. And uh, well, that may not mean anything to some people, but in my dad's set of values, uh, that was, Mount Everest. That's that's that was it. There is that was supremum and also a maximum. And at the end, I just want to steal from Erhard Schmidt. And I just say that with Harold's departure, I still can't imagine that uh, I am not going to get an email or a letter as we started our collaboration first without email. Uh, basically saying that uh, if you're interested in this problem or that problem, I am game. It's very difficult to imagine that in this life it's not going to happen. But mathematics, I think, lost in Harold one of its true nights 
and I lost my very best friend, unfortunately and sadly. So I'll finish talking with this and uh, uh, I will be happy to answer any questions. I hope I didn't run too much. Oh, I did run five minutes over time. I apologize, sorry. Uh, so that's, that's the end, unless somebody wants, has some questions. So should I stop sharing for a moment? Um, sure. Oh, I can, because I don't see you guys. I don't, you know, it's very hard to teach when you don't see uh, people's reaction, but. Hi, Dina, this is Sheldon Axler. Um, thank you. Hi, for, Sheldon. Thank you for a beautiful, beautiful talk. Um, you mentioned that, that Alan Shields pointed out to Harold um, the, the use of the Han Bonnach theorem. And I just wanted to fill in a few things about Alan. Um, Alan and Harold were actually roommates together at MIT when they were when they were they graduates. Were. There. Yeah. They were. And um, they wrote they wrote eight papers together during their lifetime. Um, all eight of them were published in in really top rate journals, and several of them have already been referenced um, throughout this conference. Um, when when Alan passed away in 1989. Um, he had been a column editor for the Mathematical Intelligencer, um, for which I was the editor-in-chief at the time. Um, so I asked Harold to write an article about Alan, and yeah. he very graciously did. Um, it, it was published in 1990 in the Mathematical Intelligencer, and the second I'll deposit it in the chat box. It's three pages long. It includes two great pictures of Harold, um, and um, it gives quite a bit of insight into, into Harold's character. So I'll deposit it now so that everyone can read it. It's a great read. It's just three pages. Thank you, Sheldon. And if I can, about that particular paper, because uh, I, I know this paper, of course, pretty well. And um, there is a little story that I can share. Harold told me when uh, I said how much I love this paper. He said, when I uh, started writing this paper, Karin, Harold's wife, he said, just make sure this, this, this article is about, not, not about Harold Shapiro, but about Alan Shields. And, <laughs> and I sort of, when I was preparing this talk, I really, it, it was my guiding light, not, not, not to press anything. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, article. And uh, unfortunately, Alan, Harold and I started working on a joint paper, which never material, it materialized as a paper of Harold, John Ackeroid, my colleague in Arkansas and myself, but uh, Alan passed away before anything significant happened. Thank on, you again, uh, the, the paper is now in the chat box. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, I, uh, there were two, paper, two articles there uh, by Harold and by Peter Duran in that issue of intelligence. Uh, Dima, can I ask a math question? Absolutely. Uh, in the place that you introduced those polynomials. Yeah. The Harold Shapira? Yes, uh, uh, here, here. The... No, uh, that, yeah, precisely here. The L infinity norm is an estimation. It's even if a rough estimation. That's true. Yeah. And it's not. It's it's a it's a difficult question. Uh, I'm not really an expert, but I think it's not entirely resolved. Uh, the sharp constant. Okay. It's yeah. it's not. I I don't think it's a sharp constant. But but nevertheless, the the box formula relating norm infinity to norm two. That's the essence of the work. I mean, yeah. And that's, that was, and I, I do believe that the question goes back to Erdish. And I, I know that uh, Jean-Pierre Tahan was uh, very keen on this particular <laughs> result. And uh, okay. because Harold never somehow, well, this guiding principle, what's in the name? <laughs> he never bothered to publish his master's thesis, although 
uh, probably it's most referred to uh, work of his, uh, as I said, because these polynomials are everywhere. Uh, and, um, but he, 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 he had kind of a, uh, some discouragement, discouraging a uh, couple of years, he went to Bell Lab and then again, he, he, then he went to Courant, uh, and that was not super successful experience. Uh, I just don't want to say much more. But then uh, Alan Shields actually invited him to, uh, to Michigan, and that was extremely successful until he moved to Sweden. Thank you. Dima, Bill Ross. Um, my, yeah, I know. <laughs> my, my colleague, I don't know if you can see us now. My colleague down the no, hall. No, I can hear you. And oh, I can recognize. <laughs> my colleague down the hall, Jim Dick Davis, is a coding theorist. And he knows very well the Gole Rudin Shapiro polynomials. And uh, he works on them himself. And uh, he has our undergraduate students constantly talking about them. So <laughs> they are, they're just, uh, they're, living on forever. Yeah, yeah, if you Google, you will see. I mean, you know, if Google is the indicator of anything, uh, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly very alive and well, that, uh, that topic. And I didn't say it, but Harold returned to it several times in his uh, life in various contexts. I just, you know, in 50 minutes, you, <laughs> you can run over 150 papers. Any other comments, questions? Uh, if not, then let's thank our speaker, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, stopping sharing.